That was the official buzzer. So now it's my turn to talk. Turn this down a little bit. I think that'll be better. As I get older, my voice gets weaker. Did you all enjoy Greg? We didn't need a microphone for him. But if you want to record anything, you got to turn the mic on. So I put a reminder. We are in 1 Peter chapter 3, starting at verse 8. I hope you all got a little class notes. Yeah. We put almost everything that's on the PowerPoint uh, here. This morning, I didn't put all the scriptures on the PowerPoint, but I did print them out here. Save you a little bit of time. If you want to turn in your Bible and follow through there, we'll stick primarily in First Peter, but we'll be out of it once in a while. If you will, join me. Our Father, we praise Thee and honor Thee, the Creator God, the God of all the universe. More importantly, You are our God, our Father. You have accepted us because of Jesus. You have forgiven us and adopted us. We thank you and we praise you. Father, as we turn to your book to read this morning, we pray that you would give us wisdom, that we would have hearts that are inclined to know and to understand. But more importantly, Father, hearts that are inclined to obey. Father, we realize that we can never measure up. We have already sinned and fallen short. And yet, Father, you have provided that day by day as we sin, we can have forgiveness through Jesus. Father, we realize we don't earn such, but we thank you. Father, we pray that you would give us courage to practice what we're doing. We thank you for the many answered prayers. We continue to pray for those that need it. Father, love us and keep us. In Jesus' name, amen. So starting in verse 8, Peter said, to sum up. So what we're doing here in this section is we are uh, summing up. But how many of you noticed Peter is like many preachers today? He said to sum up and then he goes on for as much as he'd already done. Uh, the second half of the book is coming up. But this is a summary of some obligations that we have. Verse 8, to sum up, all of you be harmonious, sympathetic, brotherly, kind-hearted, and humble in spirit, not returning evil for evil or insult for insult, but giving a blessing instead. For you were called for the very purpose that you might inherit a blessing. For the one who desires life to love and to see good days, he must keep his tongue from evil and his lips from speaking deceit. He must turn away from evil and do good. He must seek peace and pursue it. For the eyes of the Lord are toward the righteous and his ears attend unto their prayer. But the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. That is the first paragraph or section I uh, don't know if your Bible divides things up into paragraphs or not. Uh, obviously, the original didn't, but for our section, one of the things that I've learned to do is to ignore the verse breaks and look for paragraph studies. I've also learned to ignore chapter breaks because quite often the paragraph goes on. So we're going to take this simply paragraph by paragraph as I find it on that. Now, first of all, uh, there is a great deal of persecution going on in the world. We think we have it bad here because our country has changed. Uh, but when you take a look at the world map, that is simply a demographic of places where there is persecution. In fact, uh, over 360 million disciples. Now, Take that with a grain of salt because they don't all follow the book very closely, but they claim to be Christians. 
and in many countries, simply the claiming to be country a uh, Christian can cause you the loss of your life, uh, your family, your jobs, all of that. So when we deal with persecution, Peter's not dealing with our world and our time, but he's dealing with what was going on in the first century. And I want to show you just a little bit. First of all, you all remember Peter was one of the apostles and he's now in prison. He has been preaching for 30 years, lots of problems, lots of persecution, lots of opposition, but now he's been arrested and he's in prison waiting for an execution because Nero, one of the most dastardly, ungodly reprobates that have ever lived, and of course it's that kind that seemed to filter up to positions of power, and so he was there. In 64, there was the great fire that destroyed so much of of Rome. We don't know whether Nero really set that or not. I would not doubt it at all. And in 64, somewhere around there, Peter was executed. So this book, uh, uh, this and 2 Peter, were the last books that Peter wrote. Letters. What would you write if you were in prison waiting for execution What would you write to your brethren? What would you say about Nero? What would you, and all of that, Peter has a whole different perspective. I am just absolutely impressed with that. Now, when we think about persecution, one of the problems that we have is that we think wrongly. Now, Peter's going to talk about suffering absolutely amazing to me. The word suffer, suffered, suffering appears 16 times in these little chapters. Uh, And then concepts about suffering multiply that. So Peter talks about it over and over and over again. Now what he's not talking about is when you stub your toe and you don't feel good for three weeks. Uh, It's not talking about having a cold not talking about appendicitis. It is talking about suffering because you are a Christian. And that takes on a whole different perspective. Uh, So mentioned this many times. And so Peter says that you are slandered and those who revile, they revile your good behavior in Christ. That's what he's talking about. I'm going to be honest with you. I have not suffered much because of being a Christian. Uh, my brother gave me a bad time and called me a holy Joe for a while. And I got even with him. I converted him. Uh, But as we go through life, this is what Peter was talking about, was because they were Christians, they were being treated differently and wrongly. Our country is headed there. I don't know if it's going to get there or not. It may turn around. It may not. But you all need to be prepared. And I'm going to tell you, when it starts happening to you, read 1 Peter over and over and over again. Again, in verse 14, if you were reviled for the name of Christ, that is because you call yourself a Christian on that, you are blessed. You are not uh, alienated from God. They can't solve that problem, but they can make your life here miserable. And verse 16, if you suffer, suffer as a Christian. There's two avenues to that. Number one, you suffer because you are a Christian. And number two, you suffer as a Christian would suffer. You continue to act as a Christian. And that's what Peter's going to deal with. How do you respond to such persecution or or bad times? So was this government persecution? And the answer is probably not. Now, I know every time somebody gets in the book of Revelation, the first thing they do is they talk about uh, the government's persecution of Christians. The problem is the government didn't persecute Christians except spasmodically, uh, periodically. 
And then there would be times where they didn't on that. And so the government is different than that. Nero's persecution, one of the first ones, it was primarily just in Rome. It didn't bother those people in Turkey where Peter's writing to. It uh, didn't bother the people in Jerusalem. It bothered the people uh, that lived in Rome. Domitian in 95 broadened that, but there was about 25 years where there wasn't any persecution. Uh, the emperor was too busy trying to be the emperor uh, to bother with Christians who only made up 1% to 3% at the most of the Roman Empire. Uh, they weren't on the emperor's map. Uh, the, he wasn't looking for them. Plenty in 112 uh, organized crime. Uh, 125 through 160. No record of persecution by the government on that. And then a 161 uh, government persecution. Not until you get down to 300 was there a major empire-wide effort to destroy Christianity. Uh, and of course, that's how many years after Peter? 250 years. Wow. But most of that time, Christians lived. Now, I'll tell you what they suffered. They suffered because of the synagogue. They suffered because of their family. They suffered because of their jobs. They suffered because uh, they no longer worshipped uh, in the temple and they used to go worship idols. And now they don't do that anymore. And I'm going to tell you, when you become a Christian, your old friends are going to be the first ones that start giving you a bad time. Uh, if you've worked around them and you've participated in them, uh, they're going to be the first ones that notice that you have changed. Peter's going to talk about that. So the persecution in the first century was uh, fratricidal. That is, the Jews persecuted the believing Jews because they've turned their back on Judaism. They've turned their back on the law, the Torah on that, or at least that's what appeared. Uh, it was mostly local. And so the persecution that Paul had in Philippi was not related to the persecution in Corinth. And so when he got to Corinth, everything was fine for a while. And then Corinth turned. And this is the way that it went over and over again. And it was because the Christians took a stand about religion. Jesus is the only way to heaven. If you do not believe in him, you cannot be saved. Mark 16, 16, he that believeth not shall be condemned. And so they, they had to take a stand. Uh, but they also, when they did that, took a stand. Jesus is Lord, not Nero. Well, just offer an offering unto Nero as Lord and we'll let you go. I'm not going to do that. He's not Lord. He's a man. He's the emperor. I will show respect as an emperor as far as I can, but I'm not going to call him God. I'm not going to uh, worship him. Thus, from the beginning, the disciples were faced with opposition because they were Christians. Uh, so Peter said, remember something. This is not abnormal for Christians. Uh, Jesus himself said, if they persecuted me, did they? Yeah. If they persecuted me and you're going to act like me, then you're going to get persecuted. You're going to be persecuted because you're acting like me. Paul said, if you desire to live godly in Christ, you will be persecuted because you're not going to do the things of the world. You're going to be different from now on. Uh, again, Peter said, it, don't be surprised. The fiery ordeal that is among you, which comes upon you for your testing as though it's some strange thing that's happening to you. How many Christians of the first century suffered problems because they were Christians? My guess is most of them. I don't know if all of them did, but most of them would have suffered that. Paul was beaten. James was arrested and beheaded. John was exiled. The Hebrew writer says to the Hebrews that they were imprisoned and their possessions and their houses and their goods were confiscated by the government. And of course, the biggest one of all, Jesus. Persecuted. Put to death. Crucified with the worst 
punishment that Rome could mete out because it not only put you to death, it branded you as the most vile offender of the Roman uh, Empire. Was Jesus guilty of that? That's absolutely not. So did he suffer innocently? Absolutely. And how did he do that? We want to come back to that. What was the reason that Peter talks about this suffering? Now, I'm going to come back and preach on this this morning, but I'm just going to give you a foreshadowing of it. Sometimes it's vicarious. Does anybody know what vicarious means? It's not related to varicose. Something you experience through someone else. Change that word. Not necessarily through, but for someone else. And that's what Jesus suffered. Why? He bore your sins on the cross. He didn't suffer for him. He suffered for me. And so uh, we need to remember that. Sometimes it happens. And he did that because... He was reconciling us to God, giving us the way. And so he suffered, and by his wounds, by his suffering, we then were healed. Primarily, how many of you have been sick recently? Okay. We're not talking about that kind of healing. We're really talking about your spiritual healing. When it talks about the blind were made to see, I always refer people to go back to John chapter 9, and where uh, the man was healed and Jesus accused the Pharisees of being blind. And they were blind spiritually. Uh, but Peter says, Jesus died so that we could be healed, forgiven, reconciled, redeemed. And some of it is a matter of testing. Do you all remember the great book of Job? Why was Job suffering? Well, if you read the first 30 chapters and listen to his friends, it's because Job is a wicked man. But if you read the first chapter, God said, I have nobody like him. He's the best of all of the people that serve me. And so Job is being tested because of his faith. That's our example. I hope I can hold up like Job did, but I pray I don't get tested like Job did. Uh, anyway, uh, Peter said, this is a testing. Have you ever known somebody that because of the problems in life, they quit? I spent a great deal of my years preaching in Tucson, <clears throat> traipsing after people because they were discouraged. They were sad. I had one fellow and he just looked at me and he said, I know I can never measure up. I can't make this. So why bother? He had the wrong attitude about forgiveness and Jesus and mercy and God. Uh, I never did straighten that out. Uh, again, Peter said, uh, don't be surprised uh, which comes upon you for your testing. Now, I want you to notice, you will be tested. Your faith is going to be tested. Maybe not like Peter's, maybe not like Job's, but you will be tested. Uh, I try to teach the, our young people, when they go away to college, we hope they don't go away. We've got a perfectly good one here. Keep them here. Uh, but even here, some of the professors, if they find out you are a believer, the first thing they will do is try to destroy that faith. Uh, and that's a testing. They're not mad at you. They don't care. They're just going to test to see. Uh, and some do well, some don't. Sometimes it's corrective. Did God ever punish people hoping to correct them? Read the minor prophets. Uh, read the first two chapters of the book of Amos. God sent famine and fire and flood and drought. And his whole purpose was that they would return. Uh, read the first part of Revelation. And the problems that happened to many of the churches there was so that they would turn and then on and on. So God does do this correctively. And Peter talks about it from this standpoint. 
If you sin and you're harshly treated and you endure it, so did you deserve that? I was talking with a man one time and he had a totally wrong attitude. And he said, God's just going to have to get over it. And I looked at him and moved my chair back. Uh, and I said, I hope you can't sleep at night. I hope what you've done and what you've said and your attitude will simply cause you to lay awake thinking about your life and change. That's what was going to happen. So Peter said some of it is corrective. Some of it is punitive. And that is uh, make sure that you don't suffer as an evildoer. Because if you suffer as an evildoer, I'm going to look at you and go, you deserve it. Uh, Maybe I'll pray for your faith that you'll go through this, but uh, if you've done it, you probably deserve the punishment. I look back on the time that uh, my mother corrected me, <laughs> and I honestly can tell you, I deserved it. Uh, I'm not going to tell you anymore, but that's the way that works. And sometimes you suffer unjustly. Uh, one time when I deserved punishment and my mother was bound and determined to find out which one of us did it and not only me and my brother so 50-50 chance and she decided to just punish us both and about that time my brother said I did it and I knew I was in trouble <laughs> because when I got alone with my brother uh, anyway sometimes he didn't do it but he suffered the punishment for that he got even later but uh, so Peter says if you suffer and you bear up when you suffer unjustly when you don't deserve that how many of you experience that now most of my experiences here aren't because of being a Christian they were just didn't live right or or that but I've had some where they persecute you, say something. One time, one lady, she had some emotional problems, but she went to the elders and she said, he made sexual advances and threats against me. And good news, we had some good elders. And they said, when? Last Sunday morning? Where? In his sermon? And they all laughed because they were there and heard the sermon. And there was no personal uh, such action on that. But the fact that she went and uh, made the proclamation. and the uh, We had a record of it. <laughs> we recorded all of the sermons. And I had the PowerPoints. And the, I had uh, 220 witnesses. So I wasn't worried about that. But people do suffer unjustly. Most of the time moving out of the four faith thing, most of my suffering is just pure consequential. I make stupid decisions or I'm doing things that I shouldn't do. And thus there's a consequence. I always remember my friend told me one time and he borrowed it from somebody. He said, you can choose your actions. You just can't choose the consequences. And that's always true. And so every act you do, there is a consequence. There is a, a reaction. So some of that, not going to feel good. Some of it is persecution. And one of my favorite verses, uh, God hasn't explained everything. The secret things belong to God. The things that are revealed belong to us. So why did my mother get ALS when she was 93? I have no idea. Nobody does. In fact, nobody knows why anybody gets that. Uh, it's just unknown. And uh, I have a friend that she's been dealing with uh, cancer. And the first doctor she saw told her, says, you know, you just need to go home, get you a chair, put it in front of your bay window and wait to die. And she turned to her husband. She said, he's not allowed in my room anymore. And the next doctor said, oh, no, there's a program. And he put her on a different regimen and different uh, procedures. And I saw her a couple of months ago, and she's doing very well, thank you. And uh, 
So sometimes it's just unexplained. Why did she get better? I don't know. I think it's the doctors, but I don't know. So Peter's not worried about that, although he explains all of that. I was surprised to find that Peter actually dealt with those things. Didn't call them that, but that was the principle underlying that. So how do I deal with this? And the first answer is, uh, you keep a clear conscience. Now, backing up and realizing that you've loaded the wrong PowerPoint is not a good idea at this point. So I'm suffering as a consequence. Uh, the relationship that we're going to talk about now, starting in verse 8, we won't get through all of this, but we'll come back. Uh, he's talking about relationship primarily between believers. You know, uh, both preachers we've had that come and have talked with us, they told me privately, they said, you got a good group of people. And I'm going to tell you, we do. You do. Uh, and so most of this is going to be what we're already doing, but I'm just going to say, work on it, get better at it, uh, room for that. Then in verse 9, we're going to talk about uh, uh, how to deal with outsiders. But you all realize that relationships between us is all built upon character, your character, how you deal with that. But it's also dependent upon my character. Uh, because some people, they need to work on their character. But this is what Peter's dealing with. So he says, first of all, I want you to be harmonious, to live together in unity, to live together in peace and harmony. And so Second Corinthians, he said, Brethren, rejoice and be made complete, be comforted, be like-minded, live in peace. But I like that. Harmonious is to be like-minded. He said again, uh, in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 10, I want you to be of one mind and of one spirit. Now that one mind doesn't mean we're all at the same level of knowledge. What it means is we all have the same attitude about where we're going and how we're going to get there and who God is. That we can do. And we are doing that. We are to be sympathetic. Uh, that is to be caring deeply about the needs and the joys of others. Paul said in Romans 12, rejoice with them to rejoice. That's pretty good, easy to do. Weep with them who weep. And that's a little harder to do, but that's how we ought to do it. When one of us suffers, it should be that we suffer as a family. We suffer as a group. One of the things, and this is my preacher attitude coming out, and I don't even apologize for it. When brethren don't take time to know each other, when they don't attend services, when they don't attend class, when they're not the ones that make phone calls and check on people, when they're not the ones that uh, invite uh, others into their home, when they're not doing any of that thing, all of a sudden they get sick or they have a problem and nobody checks up on them and they take it personal. I can't tell you how many times my first statement is, who did you visit this week? Who did you write a note to? Who did you call this week? Were you at Bible class? I had a man complain. He said one time, he said, well, we never study the Holy Spirit. I said, we just finished a three month study on the Holy Spirit and you weren't there one single time. Oh, and that happens over and over and over again, but not with you. You control that. And so Peter said, we're going to be sympathetic. And then we are uh, brotherly. And that comes from two words. The first one uh, is phylos, which is love. And the second one is adelphos, which is brother. It's a literal translation because we're all children of God by faith. For as many as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. And so we're all one together in Christ. One faith, one Lord, one baptism, one hope. That's us together. 
I, I can't tell you, when you get out in the world, this is a refuge. When I have had to deal with the world, I like coming here and being around you. I like getting together with brethren because I don't have to worry about what they're going to say, how they're going to talk, what they're doing, what they're going to want me to do. It's just, this is a brotherhood. Now, I have trouble with the brethren in New York. I don't know, but two of them. Uh, what about all the others? I don't know. What about all the brethren that are over? I don't know. I pray for them. When I hear of persecutions and problems, I can pray for them. Here's what, I have problems with you. Or you have problems with me. And it's in this local setting that Peter really wants us to deal with that. So brotherly love. Treat each other like family. Assuming that you don't have a dysfunctional family. Uh, now, uh, I don't know anything about a lot of your families, but I'm going to tell you, we don't have a dysfunctional church. We are doing good. We are to be kind-hearted. One of my friends, a deacon in, in uh, Tucson for many years, uh, his mother told me a story one time because Mike was just so, so, so tender-hearted. Uh, he could not go to funerals. It just tore him apart. And she told me one day, she asked him to come and help her. They were going to thin out their carrots in their garden. Now, if you've ever planted carrots, you just put a whole pile of seeds down and they all grow at the same time. And if you don't go out there and thin those carrots out, you're going to have thin little carrots and none of them will get very big. And if you want nice carrots, you have to go out. So she's over there pulling them out, throwing them on the ground. And he's over there wanting to stick them back in because they're going to die. That's the kind of tender hearted that we need to be towards each other. Uh, full of compassion for each other. So that when you hear that one of us is suffering, the first response ought to be prayer. And second response is trying to do something about it if it's possible. If nothing else, you know, writing an email, writing a note, giving a phone call, just to let them know, I am thinking about you on that. Uh, we are to be humble. Why is that difficult? Now, some people deserve an inferiority complex. <laughs> uh, be careful with that. But the problem comes is people are puffed up. What are some other words and definitions or illustrations of humble versus pride? Humility, we know what it is, particularly when we see it. Uh, when we talk about pride, uh, one of my favorites was uh, an older lady said, well, if you get too big for your britches, you'll be exposed in the end. And uh, it's just one of those things. You all have known people that were puffed up? And you all loved them? Uh, it's hard to want to be around them. It's hard to... So we need to be humble. And being humble primarily, Paul said in Philippians 2, is consider others more important than yourself. You notice he doesn't say better. This isn't about better. We're all just people. And we all have value. We're all made in the image of God. But what Peter talks about is, I am to consider others as more important than self. Now, when we disbanded our eldership and went to men's meetings, I worried about this. Because y'all, we all have had elders for years. And now we're going to have... And the problem that I've set in with men's meetings is... Everybody wants to be the top one and their judgments. Everybody's got, and I'm going, you know, it doesn't work that way. We're at different levels. We have different experiences. We have different backgrounds. And so far, we have done very well. Everything has just been at peace and harmony. That's the way it should be. Uh, 
Pride does not fill up one's life. That is, if you're a Christian. And so we, we struggle to not think more highly of ourselves than we ought to think. So that's what he's talking about. And now he's going to throw in the idea of self-control. And the next verse is going to test your control. So in verse 9, he said, Not returning evil for evil, nor insult for insult, but blessing instead. For you were called for the very purpose that you might inherit. Now, this is primarily towards uh, unbelievers. I hope we don't suffer persecution from each other. I hope we don't suffer insults from each other. But I've seen it. I have seen churches that have actually had physical fights. Take it out in the parking lot and see. And I asked the two brothers that did that. I said, so... Who won the spiritual argument? I know who won the fight. But that didn't answer the spiritual thing. So Peter's talking about, what do you do when you have been done evil? What do you do when you have been insulted uh, uh, for whatever reason? You return a blessing. You pray that God will bless them. Uh, in good things. Not in the doing of evil, but in the turning of that. Blessing means that we ask God to show his favor upon those that are acting this way. Who in all of the Bible do you know did this? Jesus. When? On the cross. Actually, he did it all the time, but the specific, we always remember. What did he do? They crucified him and then at the bottom of the cross, they ridiculed him and insulted him and he prayed for them. What did he pray? He prayed a blessing. He prayed that God would bless them. Uh, He provided that. So uh, Peter talked about this. When he was reviled, he did not revile in return. While suffering, he uttered no threats, but he kept entrusting himself to God who judges righteously. And that's what you need to remember. It's not mine to retaliate, but it's God who will make everything okay. Tomorrow? Probably not. I'm hoping not. Uh, Anybody here got plans for tomorrow? (laughs) Yeah, well, if Jesus comes today, we won't do that. Uh, Luke, Jesus said, Father, forgive them. So this is the self-control. And then to to show this, he's going to quote from the psalm. Now, I hope your Bible, uh, the New American Standard I'm using does this. Anytime we have a quote from the Old Testament, it puts it in different font size and puts it over here and indents it so that it stands out. You know that we're quoting Old Testament now. The interesting thing is this psalm, if you go back and look at it in context, is about David. It's about what David would do or would not do. And how does that get applied to you? You're not David. And the answer is the Jewish people had gathered a principle that I think is right. And that is the way God acts towards his people in the Old Testament is the way God's going to respond and act to his people in the New Testament. So Peter now begins this. And it requires character. You need to have faith. So he's going to say must. And he's going to say must, must, must. You must keep your tongue from evil and your lips from speaking deceit. Put a zipper on it. That old thing, if you can't say anything good, well, I can't talk anymore. Uh, No, you learn about this. You turn away from evil and do good. Uh, It's not just mannequin religion. You all know what that is? I got that from Dan Shipley, who was over. uh, Anyway, uh, Dan said, mannequin religion, they never sin outwardly. But they don't do anything good either. Uh, And it's not just not sinning, but it's learning to do good. And then seek peace. And pursue it. 
And the reason that he gives is the next verse starts with a little word for. Because, for this reason, for God's eyes are toward the righteous. That means God looks with favor upon those that are righteous. And he hears their prayers. How many of you recognize God has not promised to hear everybody's prayers? In fact, the prayers of people that willfully sin are an abomination to the Lord. He not only doesn't hear them, it disgusts him that they would do that. And his face is against those that are evil. Now, this is not do one evil. This is they're doing evil. Uh, this is their character. So this is about God's character interacting with your character. And if you want God to bless you and to have a good life, this is what you need to do. Now, he then asks a question, verse 13. Who is there to harm you if you prove zealous for what is good? The answer is Nero, my brother, my neighbor, uh, the people you work with. Now, this is not normal. If you are minding your own business and uh, uh, speaking like you ought to speak and doing what you ought to do, basically you're not going to have a lot of problems. But every once in a while, you will meet somebody that is cantankerous and ungodly and doesn't like you and going to prove you're just, well, there are those. So verse 14 says, while it's not normal... It does happen. Even if you should suffer for the sake of righteousness, you're blessed. You're not cursed. Being persecuted for righteousness is a stamp of approval. You're doing something right. That's why they're persecuting. You know, that verse we quoted earlier, all that will live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. And then I look at my life and I'm going, I'm not suffering. What does that mean? I'm not living. Okay. Now, you can't always draw those negative type conclusions on that. But there is a correlation on that. So you may suffer persecution when you don't deserve it. Most Christians didn't deserve what they got in the first century from those persecutions. But... We have it. Now, when that takes place, Peter said just what Jesus said, don't fear. When angels appeared unto people, you know what their first words were? Almost every time, don't fear. What do you think it's like to meet an angel face to face? Scary. <laughs> Absolutely. That's why they said, don't fear. I, I've read things where guys were saying, you know, an angel appeared and talked to me while I was shaving this morning. And I'm looking to see how many cuts. <laughs> because it would be different. And so he said, don't fear and don't be troubled by such. Going back to where we started, how many people walk away from God, Jesus, church? Because of trouble. It happens. And Jesus warned us about that. And that's what that word troubled means. It means you're not agitated by this. Uh, the psalmist said one time, I beheld that the ungodly were fat and happy and rich and no problems at all. He misstated that, by the way. But that's not true. Some of them are. Have you ever known somebody that was really rich and not very nice and lived to a long old age? I can give you a list. <laughs> it happens. Did they live a long age because God was blessing them? No, he was giving them a chance to repent. <laughs> uh, but they didn't see it that way. So he said, don't be troubled. Now, starting next week, we're going to uh, finish up this one. I don't know if we're going to finish the whole chapter because it has one of the most troubling verses in all of Scripture. And uh, I planned on doing a whole week on it. 
it slows me down. I was trying to do a chapter a week, but you all see I can't do that. Uh, so read 1 Peter 3 every day this week, and you'll see what I'm talking about. Thank you.